we decided to visit a good friend of Ishmael's restaurant called the Facebook for lunch. The food was traditional Western food and delicious, and it was a really, really nice place. A young couple sat down to talk with Kadia, and I overheard them talking about the mining areas, a subject I really wanted to know more about, since learning of the conflict diamonds or blood diamonds in the wards to control the natural minerals in Salon. Jaka Jusu was from Sierra Leone and based in Sierra Leone. He worked for the Electrical Mutual, a mining operation of peroxides. Thinking of the mining industry in this country brought to mind issues of child labor and exploitation, as well as the Civil War. Without insinuating too much, I asked Jaka if there had been improvement in the mining business. I, I believe the, the emergence of the mining industry in Sierra Leone has been a major contributing factor to the rapid developmental trend which the country has taken for the past five years. You know, the introduction of um, the National Minerals Agency by the government of Sierra Leone has ensured that um, the country is now in a better position to benefit a lot from its natural resources. Because of the establishment of this agency, the level of awareness amongst Sierra Leoneans you know, has increased and um, the country stands to gain a lot now. The communities and the country as a whole they stand to gain a lot. So I believe it will be safe to say at the moment the country gains a lot from its mineral resources than it was some 20, 30 years back. Jaka has been working in this mining industry for about a year now, which really isn't surprising, since it's mainly a male-dominated occupation. But how is it for women? Jaka's wife, Esther, works for the London Mining Company. This company has been in Sierra Leone for about nine years and mines for iron and ore. Uh, yes, it's... We have very few women, especially in the engineering sector. Uh, you will not find so many women there. In other areas like procurement, administration, and, but in the mines, as in the mining sites, where they do the mining, there are not so many women there. Yeah. But um, in other areas like the administration, and because we have a, a head office here in Freetown, you'll find lots of women there. But in the mining sites, it's purely men, most of them, yeah. Yeah, okay, and so how has it been? How does it, how does it feel to it? How has it been for you? Uh, as a woman, sometimes it's a bit difficult because um, we are being limited, you know. It, they see it as if there are some things that we cannot do, which probably if they give us the chance, we can do better, yeah. And uh, so, it's, so you're limited by your opportunities to grow? Yes, okay. ma'am. We are limited by on our opportunities to grow uh, because they think that we can do certain things. So. And do you foresee that? Do you think that will change over time? I do think so, yes. It will change over time because um, they have seen so many changes. Because in the areas where they have given us opportunities, they have seen that we can do more and we can do better. So definitely, it's, it's, it's getting better. So Esther and her husband both feel that the industry is heading in the right direction and positive changes have been made. They both are considered successful because these are jobs with good pay. But like many jobs, it comes with a sacrifice. It's very, it's very, very challenging. I think that's what I find most difficult about working in the mines because... What's challenging? What exactly is very challenging? For most of the time, I have to be away, away from my family, a very young family. You know? There are moments when I need to be around <laughs> My wife. For me, that's the toughest part of the job. Yes. There are also some other difficulties like changing environment because really walking down at Gondama, it's really, really cold out there. You know, it's cold. Then you get to meet people from different backgrounds. You know, the the locals that are down there. 
they have a different mentality, a different way of thinking, different, quite different from how we do things down here. So you also have to adjust to that. There's also the language barrier, you know. Most of the guys, they communicate effectively in the local language, which is Mende, you know. There's also the language barrier. And also, we have expatriates also that, that, that do not communicate in English as well. So it's like we are caught up between them. So that's also very challenging for me. But uh, over time, I've found a way to cope with that. But what I still can't cope with is being away from my family. I can tell they are both bothered by the amount of time they must live apart in order to make a living. And living in a place like this with limited opportunities, it's almost impossible to be choosy. I really appreciated their honesty and the fact that they even talked with me about this sensitive topic. But I still couldn't help wondering how they would be in the future. Open Government Initiative, or OGI, Director Khadija Sise invited all of us to her home in Kent Beach for New Year's, about 30 miles outside of Freetown, and is basically located at the tip of the peninsula. The trip there was full of mountains and dirt, beautiful to me. I'd never heard of Kent Beach, and this is quite surprising, since Kent Beach actually played a major role in the slave industry. Slaves were held here by Portuguese slave traders in what they call pens, up to 500 slaves at a time. A coastal fishing village, the major industry is fishing, coal mining, and tourism, and it's known for its large beaches. I know. You know, you and I, coming in. Come, come. Khadija's home on a private beach was breathtaking. Why don't I see these images in the media? I couldn't wait to take a look around. So this is Khadija Shali. Look at the private beach. Oh, that's nice. I know. This place was a, uh, uh, let me, a forest, not a zone, a big bush. This place was a forest. I founded this place and I sent my surveyor to survey for those people over there. With stones? Yeah. There's still water there. There's still water there. These stones, the grounds, the wells, are the originals and once belonged to one of the major slave traders and governor of Kent Beach. This is where his house was. If you stand over here, you will see the... You see the stones, the way they lay them? Yeah. This was the road. You see that? You I see? think this was the walkway. The walkway, you see? To the sea. The driveway. Yeah. No, to the sea. No, to the house. To the house. You see the driveway? You see the way they lay the stones? Yeah. You yeah. can tell. Yeah. You see this? You see the. You remember that those times they have those little vehicles? Mm -hmm. You see this? Over here is the area where the cooking house was located and still is. Like Ishmael, Khadija has housekeepers, cooks, security, and groundkeepers. This is how life is maintained. One of Khadija's groundkeepers shows us where the flag used to be. This spot marks a place where the exchange would actually take place. If there's a service you can provide to someone, you can make money to take care of yourself and your family, one helping out the other. That's not a bad idea. Uh, what was once a slave owner's residence and headquarters, meeting the body of water where Africans would be shipped to Banana Island and into slavery, now belongs to Khadija. Ironic, isn't it? I wonder how does that feel? 
it feels good. Yeah. It feels very good. Oh, you know, you, this it gives a sense of belonging. You know, knowing yeah. that we we are back and we have it. We have what is ours, and now we are going to um, enjoy it. God will. We are going to enjoy it. Okay. Yes. Uh, with you, with you guys, <laughs> yes. because somebody had to suffer for us to be here today. Yeah. So, um, we pray that um, you all will enjoy it again with us here. Because this is the year of prosperity. This is the, the era of prosperity in Africa. And we look forward to enjoying the prosperity with you all. Not everything is is gone. We still have more. We are every we are some is taken. There is still more to share. So we look forward to sharing it with you all. In the name of God. <laughs> yes. My thoughts immediately go to the issue of reparations and how it would feel to be given land that African slaves worked, lived, and died on in America. I'm also thinking about how having 40 acres and a mule on a beautiful beach in Sierra Leone during the summers would be. It's really extremely amazing, almost surreal, almost captivating where something takes something is taken from you mentally and emotionally to stand on the spot where slaves were shipped in and out where they were farmed where they have farms to feed themselves the cement that's left over where they had homes knowing that they left the wharf here possibly never to return that I'm walking on the grounds of my ancestors that I'm walking on the grounds and the footprints that they've laid before us all so that we wouldn't forget. It's really, really amazing and really sad. There's a sadness knowing that the ocean can provide so much freedom, yet takes so much freedom away. To reclaim it is a wonderful, wonderful feeling I can only imagine. Even with all of the atrocities from the past, this is a beautiful place with a peaceful feeling now. It's really hard to believe that such crimes against humanity took place against such a beautiful backdrop, but they did. I greeted the early morning as usual, capturing the beauty of it all. Before leaving Kent, Khadija arranged for us to have a tour of the area that we were not able to see last night, a part of the history of the slave trade that was important. So we hit the road once again. I love the entrepreneurial spirit of Sierra Leoneans. They absolutely try to make do with what they have. This young man is the chief of Kent. Yes, this young man is a chief.
We arrived at what was called the Gateway, where a young group of men met us. They are going to be our tour guides for today. This area was where African slaves lived first. Then they were enslaved and housed here. And then later, these same buildings were converted into churches. These are the original bricks of the gateway opening to the church area. Well, I said I'm just thinking that, you know, this is place is a very quiet environment, mm -hmm. away from Freetown, maybe. You can do whatever you want to do here, mm -hmm. and nobody yeah, will see. There, there I think that's, that's partially why, why they would have chosen this particular area. And this is where the minister lived. As you can see, this area has not been cleaned up since the big party last night, but I'm told by the afternoon all of this will be cleared away. These graves, um, he had a very, um, and Carol, Carol, one of the masters, the slave masters. These and tombstones the mark the resting places of the past, of European descent, and across this bridge, the remains of Africans. So back here where you see the bricks that are set on top of each other, those are where the slaves are, the, the burial part of the slaves. So they just squeeze them like this, like this, just bent like this way when they bury them. Hard to believe how they mutilated the bodies even after death. Religion appears to frame the slave industry, an ironic portrait indeed. Missionaries converted Africans into Christians and standard buildings into foundations of religion, like this church, the Kent Anglican Diocese. Renovations were done in 1901, restoring the clock that sits at the tip of this landmark and this, the original bell and mallet that was used to call people to worship. There was so much to take in, but I really wasn't prepared for this. This is a church that was transformed into holding pens. Underneath this church, enslaved Africans were kept until boats arrived to take them into destinations of slavery. I was just saying that I was looking at the stones, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of block, the, the square shape of the stones. A striking similarity to the, remember the well we saw there? Mm -hmm. um, it, there's that resemblance of the way they were doing the stone, like a square. And when we look at the well there, it's, there's a striking similarity of what I'm seeing here and here. And even the facade we saw in the front there. Yeah. This is where they kept the slaves, bent over and held underneath the church for days and weeks. It's really disturbing to see this. A beautiful yet emotional couple of days bringing in the new year. Kent Beach, a name I will not forget. During our trip back to Freetown, Mary talked about her family's connection to missionaries in Sierra Leone. Her family's background is Methodist and they have colonial names, names appropriately. Grandpa Leroy Graham, then my, to my dad's side. Ms. Mary, James, uh, Mary, James, Cecilia, Kerry. Um, yeah. um, then Andrew, Uncle Andrew. As colonial and African as their ancestors may be, 
she still finds it vital for African Americans to know about their roots. I think it will be it will be a really good idea for them to come more. They're gonna bring their own accept what they think about the country and especially the way the history that they've been giving them in the West, you know, for them to come and learn something here and they can make their own conclusion about in Sierra Leone, because the way the meat, there was a lot of meat in America, where the, what they always, to me, I call it poison the mind of African Americans, you know. And there's a lot of breach, because I remember a friend of mine that used to do my hair said, How come Africans doesn't like African America? And I said to her, that, How does our relationship is? I'm an African, you're an African American. And she said, that's the point. I said, do you see anything that I don't like you? And she said, no. I said, because we, this is the myth that's to bring this, the, the, cliff, the, the, the view between one, one race to another one. Because if all of us united, there will be a good front for, um, uh, for us. Well, so that's the reason why I think if anybody can to come and meet with the people, then they can um, do their own conclusion about what they think you know, it's going on. So I think it's really good. Well, there's Hollywood in the States, Bollywood in India, and Nollywood from Nigeria. While we waited for a ferry one day, we stumbled upon a film crew shooting a movie directed by one of the most prominent Nigerian actors and directors named Ramsey Noah. You're on the phone, that's lovely. You're on the phone, that's lovely. In 2010, Noah won the African Movie Academy Award for Best Actor in a Leading Role. How amazing is that? We actually catch them in production of an upcoming movie. They were all really nice and allowed me to shoot footage of them working. And that is, and, until I started to get in the way. Which was understandable. But it was really neat to catch the great director in action and the making of a legitimate Nollywood movie. Soon, Kadil will be heading back to the States, so while she was preparing for her trip, Mary and I decided to head into town for some sightseeing and shopping. Yes. There used to be a bridge in this area with clean water. Yeah, they, they used to have clean water. Oops, sorry. Clean water that used to come, they, they never had a slum. It doesn't look like that at all anymore. The war destroyed the bridge and the runoff systems so trash and debris run right off into this area, creating puddles of bacteria and diseases where people now live. It's known now as Shantytown. What's even worse is that when torrential rains and storms come, the people refuse to leave and are flooded out. Some have even died. And you know, the story reminds me of Hurricane Katrina, when some refused to leave their homes. Like a captain going down with the ship, they too perished with the things they loved their homes, and even their lives. Things must get better. What's your name? Sally Martin. Let's go. As we made our way through the streets, I enjoyed the sights and picked up a few snacks along the way. I love this shop-as-you-go routine. Literally, shopping without ever parking. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. Watch my bag.
They are saying that they just want to do business. They don't want to be prostitutes. They're not educated, and they only have their business knowledge. Without entrepreneurship in a poor country, I wonder what are the options? This is a serious problem. So the women have to not only move from the streets, but they must find another way to make a living. The forecast for this type of future can be dismal for women of a certain age. The older ones can't go back to school. Some of the younger ones can't afford to go to school, but they all must find a new way of making a living. The streets are the busiest places in Freetown, a roadway of trade and commerce. So if the women were to move, where would they go? Where could they go to have the consistent foot traffic, people traffic, or traffic in general to sell their goods? I could feel the intense energy these women were creating, the power of their words as I was shooting. I'm wondering what will happen to them if the president doesn't reverse his directive for them to move from the streets. So if they take away the market, yeah. so if they take away the market, that's, they call then they're the saying they may have to prostitute no, they themselves? Don't no, they're just saying that they don't want to be that way. Uh -huh. That's what they have to They want to be self-sufficient because they're not educated to have a government job and other educate, educative uh, jobs. What they have is their business knowledge to sell and to make ends meet. So they work for them, they need the business. Okay. So, help educate their kids. Okay. If they don't have that, so the kids will be in the streets. That's what they were demonstrating, that they need something. Mm -hmm. And I guess because it's so, po it's so populated that I don't think they have all places. Mm -hmm. The government has to just create sites to try to put them where people will go and buy like it used to be. Arriving to Sylvia's was like arriving home, with all of the things that are welcoming. The sound of children playing, food cooking in a wood-burning pot, and hair being braided. Later that night, I spent some time with Mary's niece, Christiana. This is Christian's little daughter. She is so pretty and innocent to me. I wonder how much of the world she has been protected from. I told her she was beautiful and pretty, and she kind of looked at me strange. So I asked her, do you know what that means? Okay, so you don't know, I'm going to tell you what pretty is. Because then you'll find out that your name is pretty, and you are pretty. Okay? All right. Well, I want you to first see yourself. So you see yourself, right? Okay, this is what I see when I see something pretty or I hear something pretty. You know when you're walking in a garden, like outside, okay? And you look all around and all of a sudden you see this really beautiful flower. It's like, where did that come from? I have to pluck it and take it with me. Because it's so pretty. It's yellow or white or red. It's beautiful. Do you know what beautiful is? Okay. Beautiful and pretty are the same thing. Okay. So, when I hear your name, which is? I say, what a pretty name. Now you know what that means, right? 
Daphne's beautiful, right? And when I see you, just like, look, that's you right there. I say, oh, isn't she pretty? Isn't she beautiful? Oh, you're so welcome. So then now you know what it means. Okay? It's a good thing, right? So you see yourself? Wave. Say bye-bye. <laughs> say I'm beautiful. And say I'm pretty. Yay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very pretty. I took it easy on Christmas Day and now it's January 2nd and again Ishmael insists that we take the evening off for rest. Guess what? We're 17 years old tonight and we're going out to the club to dance. Yeah. So wish us luck. Maybe I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Maybe, if I'm awake. <laughs> We don't want to. Now, does this little one look happy? Mary's little niece, Christiana, is so sad because we're about to leave for our next adventure. And by the time we return, she'll be gone. She has really bonded with her Aunt Mary, an aunt that she hasn't seen in years. My maternal skills were engaged, so I reached out to the baby and tried to comfort her. That usually works. So can we take a picture now? You ready? Huh? Let's take a picture. Tell me here. Tell me here. What are you saying? What's wrong? Yeah? Okay. So we want to go see what Auntie's doing because you have a lot of planning to do. You have a lot of planning to do. Okay? You have to come up with three things that we need to do when we come back up for you and your aunt to have fun. Three things. Okay? So you have to think about it. Let's go see what our aunt, your aunt is doing. Okay? Let's go see what she's doing. Okay? Because this is not working at all. And as you can see, the only one who was smiling was me. <laughs> we were all so sorry that we couldn't take her with us. Hopefully, we will see her again. <laughs>